Section three of the Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gothica Faircourt. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section three, problem three an intangible clue have you studied the case not i not studied the case which for the last few days has provided the papers with such conspicuous headlines i do not read the papers i have not looked at one in a whole week miss strange your social engagements must be of a very pressing nature just now they are and your business sense in abeyance how so you would not ask if you had read the papers to this she made no reply save by a slight toss of her pretty head if her employer felt nettled by this show of indifference he did not betray it save by the rapidity of his tones as without further preamble and possibly without real excuse he proceeded to lay before her the case in question. Last Tuesday night, a woman was murdered in the city. An old woman in a lonely house where she has lived for years. Perhaps you remember this house? It occupies a not inconspicuous site in 17th Street, a house of the olden time. Now I do not remember. The extreme carelessness of Miss Strange's tone would have been fatal to her socially, but then she would never have used it socially. This they both knew, yet he smiled with his customary indulgence. Then I will describe it. She looked around for a chair and sank into it. He did the same. It has a fan light over the front door. She remained impassive and two old-fashioned strips of party-colored glass on either side. And a knocker between its panels, which may bring money some day. Oh, you do remember. I thought you would, Miss Strange. Yes, fan lights over doors are becoming very rare in New York. Very well, then. That house was the scene of Tuesday's tragedy. The woman who has lived there in solitude for years was foully murdered. I have since heard that the people who knew her best have always anticipated some such violent end for her. She never allowed maid or friend to remain with her after five in the afternoon. Yet she had money, some think a great deal, always in the house. I am interested in the house, not in her. Yet she was a character as full of whims and crotchets as a nut is of meat. Her death was horrible. She fought. Her dress was torn from her body in rags. This happened, you see, before her hour for retiring, some think as early as six in the afternoon, and here he made a rapid gesture to catch Violet's wandering attention. In spite of the struggle, in spite of the fact that she was dragged from room to room, that her person was searched and everything in the house searched, that drawers were pulled out of bureaus, doors wrenched off of cupboards, china smashed upon the floor, whole shelves denuded, and not a spot from cellar to garret left unransacked. No direct clue to the perpetrator has been found. Nothing that gives any idea of his personality, save his display of strength and great cupidity. The police have even deigned to consult me, an unusual procedure, but I could find nothing either. Evidences of fiendish purpose abound, of relentless search, but no clue to the man himself. It's uncommon, isn't it, not to have any clue? I suppose so. Miss Strange hated murders, and it was with difficulty she could be brought to discuss them. But she was not going to be let off, not this time. You see, he proceeded insistently, 
it's not only mortifying to the police but disappointing to the press especially as few reporters believe in the no thoroughfare business they say and we cannot but agree with them that no such struggle could take place and no such repeated goings to and fro through the house without some vestige being left by which to connect this crime with its daring perpetrator still she stared down at her hands those little hands so white and fluttering so seemingly helpless under the weight of their many rings and yet so slyly capable she must have queer neighbors came at last from miss strange's reluctant lips didn't they hear or see anything of all this she has no neighbors that is after half past five o'clock there's a printing establishment on one side of her a deserted mansion on the other side and nothing but warehouses back and front there was no one to notice what took place in her small dwelling after the printing house was closed she was the most courageous or the most foolish of women to remain there as she did but nothing except death could budge her she was born in the room where she died was married in the one where she worked saw husband father mother and five sisters carried out in turn to their graves through the door with the fanlight over the top and these memories held her you are trying to interest me in the woman don't no i'm not trying to interest you in her only trying to explain her there was another reason for her remaining where she did so long after all residents had left the block she had a business oh she embroidered monograms for fine ladies she did but you needn't look at me like that she never embroidered any for me no she did first-class work i saw some of it miss strange if i could get you into that house for ten minutes not to see her but to pick up the loose intangible thread which i am sure is floating around in it somewhere wouldn't you go violet slowly rose a movement which he followed to the letter must i express in words the limit i have set for myself in our affair she asked when for reasons i have never thought myself called upon to explain i consented to help you a little now and then with some matter where a woman's tact and knowledge of the social world might tell without offence to herself or others i never thought it would be necessary for me to state that temptation must stop with such cases or that i should not be asked to touch the sordid or the bloody but it seems i was mistaken and that i must stoop to be explicit the woman who was killed on tuesday might have interested me greatly as an embroiderer but as a victim not at all what do you see in me or miss in me that you should drag me into an atmosphere of low-down crime nothing miss strange you are by nature as well as by breeding very far removed from everything of the kind but you will allow me to suggest that no crime is low down which makes imperative demand upon the intellect and intuitive sense of its investigator only the most delicate touch can feel and hold the thread i've just spoken of and you have the most delicate touch i know do not attempt to flatter me i have no fancy for handling befouled spiderwebs besides if i had if such elusive filaments fascinated me how could i well known in person and name enter upon such a scene without prejudice to our mutual compact miss strange she had reseated herself but so far he had failed to follow her example an ignoring of the subtle hint that her interest might yet be caught which seemed to annoy her a trifle i should not even have suggested such a possibility had i not seen a way of introducing you there without risk to your position or mine 
among the boxes piled upon mrs doolittle's table boxes of finished work most of them addressed and ready for delivery was one on which could be seen the name of shall i mention it not mine you don't mean mine that would be too odd too ridiculously odd i should not understand a coincidence of that kind no i should not notwithstanding the fact that i have lately sent out such work to be done yet it was your name very clearly and precisely written your whole name miss strange i saw and read it myself but i gave the order to madame pierrot on fifth avenue how came my things to be found in the house of this woman of whose horrible death we have been talking did you suppose that madame pierrot did such work with her own hands or even had it done in her own establishment mrs doolittle was universally employed she worked for a dozen firms you will find the biggest names on most of her packages but on this one i allude to the one addressed to you there was more to be seen than the name these words were written on it in another hand send without opening this struck the police as suspicious sufficiently so at least for them to desire your presence at the house as soon as you can make it convenient to open the box exactly the curl of miss strange's disdainful lip was a sight to see you wrote those words yourself she coolly observed while someone's back was turned you whipped out your pencil and resorted to a very pardonable subterfuge highly conducive to the public's good but never mind that will you go miss strange became suddenly demure i suppose i must she grudgingly conceded however obtained a summons from the police cannot be ignored even by peter strange's daughter another man might have displayed his triumph by smile or gesture but this one had learned his role too well he simply said very good shall it be at once i have a taxi at the door but she failed to see the necessity of any such hurry with sudden dignity she replied that won't do if i go to this house it must be under suitable conditions i shall have to ask my brother to accompany me your brother oh he's safe he he knows your brother knows her visitor with less control than usual betrayed very openly his uneasiness he does and approves but that's not what interests us now only so far as it makes it possible for me to go with propriety to that dreadful house a formal bow from the other and the words they may expect you then can you say when within the next hour but it will be a useless concession on my part she pettishly complained a place that has been gone over by a dozen detectives is apt to be brushed clean of its cobwebs even if such ever existed that's the difficulty he acknowledged and did not dare to add another word she was at that particular moment so very much the great lady and so little his confidential agent he might have been less impressed however by this sudden assumption of manner had he been so fortunate as to have seen how she employed the three-quarters of an hour's delay for which she had asked she read those neglected newspapers especially the one containing the following highly colored narration of this ghastly crime a door ajar an empty hall a line of sinister-looking blotches marking a guilty step diagonally across the flagging silence and an unmistakable odor repugnant to all humanity such were the indications which met the eyes of officer o'leary on his first round last night and led to the discovery of a murder which will long thrill the city by its mystery and horror both the house and the victim are well known 
here followed a description of the same and of mrs doolittle's manner of life in her ancient home which violet hurriedly passed over to come to the following as far as one can judge from appearances the crime happened in this wise mrs doolittle had been in her kitchen as the tea-kettle found singing on the stove goes to prove and was coming back through her bedroom when the wretch who had stolen in by the front door which to save steps she was unfortunately in the habit of leaving on the latch till all possibility of customers for the day was over sprang upon her from behind and dealt her a swinging blow with the poker he had caught up from the hearthstone whether the struggle which ensued followed immediately upon this first attack or came later it will take medical experts to determine but whenever it did occur the fierceness of its character is shown by the grip taken upon her throat and the traces of blood which are to be seen all over the house if the wretch had lugged her into her workroom and thence to the kitchen and thence back to the spot of first assault the evidences could not have been more ghastly bits of her clothing torn off by a ruthless hand lay scattered all over these floors in her bedroom where she finally breathed her last there could be seen mingled with these a number of large but worthless glass beads and close against one of the baseboards the string which had held them as shown by the few remaining beads still clinging to it if in pulling the string from her neck he had hoped to light upon some valuable booty his fury at his disappointment is evident you can almost see the frenzy with which he flung the would-be necklace at the wall and kicked about and stamped upon its rapidly rolling beads booty that was what he was after to find and carry away the poor needlewoman's supposed hoardings if the scene baffles description if as some believe he dragged her yet living from spot to spot demanding information as to her places of concealment under threat of repeated blows and finally baffled dealt the finishing stroke and proceeded on the search alone no greater devastation could have taken place in this poor woman's house or effects yet such was his precaution and care for himself that he left no fingerprint behind him nor any other token which could lead to personal identification even though his footsteps could be traced in much the order i have mentioned they were of so indeterminate and shapeless a character as to convey little to the intelligence of the investigator that these smears they could not be called footprints not only crossed the hall but appeared in more than one place on the staircase proves that he did not confine his search to the lower story and perhaps one of the most interesting features of the case lies in the indications given by these marks of the raging course he took through these upper rooms as the accompanying diagram will show we omit the diagram he went first into the large front chamber thence to the rear where we find two rooms one unfinished and filled with accumulated stuff most of which he left lying loose upon the floor and the other plastered and containing a window opening upon an alleyway at the side but empty of all furniture and without even a carpet on the bare boards why he should have entered the latter place and why having entered he should have crossed to the window will be plain to those who have studied the conditions the front chamber windows were tightly shuttered the attic ones cumbered with boxes and shielded from approach by old bureaus and discarded chairs this one only was free and although darkened by the proximity of the house neighboring it across the alley was the only spot on the story where sufficient light could be had at this late hour for the examination of any object of whose value he was doubtful 
that he had come across such an object and had brought it to this window for some such purpose is very satisfactorily demonstrated by the discovery of a worn-out wallet of ancient make lying on the floor directly in front of this window a proof of his cupidity but also proof of his ill luck for this wallet when lifted and opened was found to contain two hundred or more dollars in old bills which if not the full hoard of their industrious owner was certainly worth the taking by one who had risked his neck for the sole purpose of theft this wallet and the flight of the murderer without it give to this affair otherwise simply brutal a dramatic interest which will be appreciated not only by the very able detectives already hot upon the chase but by all other inquiring minds anxious to solve a mystery of which so estimable a woman has been the unfortunate victim a problem is presented to the police there violet stopped when not long after the superb limousine of peter strange stopped before the little house in seventeenth street it caused a veritable sensation not only in the curiosity mongers lingering on the sidewalk but to the two persons within the officer on guard and a belated reporter though dressed in her plainest suit violet strange looked much too fashionable and far too young and thoughtless to be observed without emotion entering a scene of hideous and brutal crime even the young man who accompanied her promised to bring a most incongruous element into this atmosphere of guilt and horror and as the detective on guard whispered to the man beside him might much better have been left behind in the car but violet was great for the proprieties and young arthur followed her in her entrance was a coup de theatre she had lifted her veil in crossing the sidewalk and her interesting features and general air of timidity were very fetching as the man holding open the door noted the impression made upon his companion he muttered with sly facetiousness you think you'll show her nothing but I'm ready to bet a fiver that she'll want to see it all, and that you'll show it to her. The detective's grin was expressive, notwithstanding the shrug with which he tried to carry it off. And Violet? The hall into which she now stepped from the most vivid sunlight had never been considered even in its palmiest days as possessing cheer, even of the stately kind the ghastly green light infused through it by the colored glass on either side of the doorway seemed to promise yet more dismal things beyond must i go in there she asked pointing with an admirable simulation of nervous excitement to a half-shut door at her left is there where it happened arthur do you suppose that there is where it happened no no miss the officer made haste to assure her if you are miss strange violet bowed i need hardly say that the woman was struck in her bedroom the door beside you leads into the parlor or as she would have called it her workroom you needn't be afraid of going in there you will see nothing but the disorder of her boxes they were pretty well pulled about not all of them though he added watching her as closely as the dim light permitted there is one which gives no sign of having been tampered with it was done up in wrapping paper and is addressed to you which in itself would not have seemed worthy of our attention had not these lines been scribbled on it in a man's handwriting send without opening how odd exclaimed the little minx with widely opened eyes and an air of guileless innocence whatever can it mean nothing serious i am sure for the woman did not even know me she was employed to do this work by madame pierrot didn't you know that it was to be done here no i thought madame pierrot's own girls did her embroidery for her so that you were surprised 
wasn't I, to get our message. I didn't know what to make of it. The earnest, half-injured look with which she uttered this disclaimer did its appointed work. The detective accepted her for what she seemed, and, oblivious to the reporter's satirical gesture, crossed to the workroom door, which he threw wide open with the remark, I should be glad to have you open that box in our presence. It is undoubtedly all right, but we wish to be sure. You know what the box should contain? Oh, yes, indeed, pillowcases and sheets with a big S embroidered on them. Very well. Shall I undo the string for you? I shall be much obliged, said she, her eye flashing quickly about the room before settling down upon the knot he was deftly loosening. Her brother, gazing indifferently in from the doorway, hardly noticed this look, but the reporter at his back did, though he failed to detect its penetrating quality. "'Your name is on the other side,' observed the detective as he drew away the string and turned the package over. The smile which just lifted the corner of her lips was not an answer to this remark, but to her recognition of her employer's handwriting in the words under her name, send without opening. She had not misjudged him. The cover you may like to take off yourself, suggested the officer as he lifted the box out of its wrapper. Oh, I don't mind. There's nothing to be ashamed of in embroidered linen. Or perhaps that is not what you are looking for? No one answered. All were busy watching her whip off the lid and lift out the pile of sheets and pillowcases with which the box was closely packed. Shall I unfold them? she asked. The detective nodded. Taking out the topmost sheet, she shook it open. Then the next and the next till she reached the bottom of the box. Nothing of a criminating nature came to light. The box, as well as its contents, was without mystery of any kind. This was not an unexpected result, of course, but the smile with which she began to refold the pieces and throw them back into the box revealed one of her dimples, which was almost as dangerous to the casual observer as when it revealed both. There, she exclaimed, you see, household linen, exactly as I said. Now may I go home? Certainly, Miss Strange. The detective stole a sly glance at the reporter. She was not going in for the horrors then, after all. But the reporter abated nothing of his knowing air, for while she spoke of going, she made no move towards doing so, but continued to look about the room till her glances finally settled on a long, dark curtain shutting off an adjoining room. There's where she lies, I suppose, she feelingly exclaimed, and not one of you knows who killed her. Somehow I cannot understand that. Why don't you know when that's what you're hired for? The innocence with which she uttered this was astonishing. The detective began to look sheepish, and the reporter turned aside to hide his smile. Whether in another moment either would have spoken, no one can say, for with a mock consciousness of having said something foolish, she caught up her parasol from the table and made a start for the door. But, of course, she looked back. I was wondering, she recommenced, with a half-wistful, half-speculative air, whether I should ask to have a peep at the place where it all happened. The reporter chuckled behind the pencil end he was chewing, but the officer maintained his solemn air, for which act of self-restraint he was undoubtedly grateful, when in another minute she gave a quick, impulsive shudder, not altogether assumed, and vehemently added, But I couldn't stand the sight. No, I couldn't. I'm an awful coward when it comes to things like that. Nothing in all the world would induce me to look at the woman or her room. But I should like... Here both her dimples came into play, though she could not be said exactly to smile. 
just one little look upstairs where he went poking about so long without any fear it seems of being interrupted ever since i've read about it i have seen in my mind a picture of his wicked figure sneaking from room to room tearing open drawers and flinging out the contents of closets just to find a little money a little little money I shall not sleep tonight just for wondering how those high-up attic rooms really look. Who could dream that back of this display of mingled childishness and audacity there lay hidden purpose, intellect, and a keen knowledge of human nature? Not the two men who listened to this seemingly irresponsible chatter. To them she was a child to be humored, and humor her they did. The dainty feet which had already found their way to that gloomy staircase were allowed to ascend, followed, it is true, by those of the officer who did not dare to smile back at the reporter because of the brother's watchful and none too conciliatory eye. At the stairhead she paused to look back. I don't see those horrible marks which the papers describe as running all along the lower hall and up these stairs. No, Miss Strange, they have gradually been rubbed out, but you will find some still showing on these upper floors. Oh, oh, where? You frighten me, frighten me horribly. But, but if you don't mind, I should like to see... Why should not a man on a tedious job amuse himself? Piloting her over to the small room in the rear, he pointed down at the boards. She gave one look and then stepped gingerly in. Just look, she cried, a whole string of marks going straight from door to window. They have no shape, have they? Just blotches. I wonder why one of them is so much larger than the rest. This was no new question. It was one which everybody who went into the room was sure to ask. There was such a difference in the size and appearance of the mark nearest the window. The reason, well, minds were divided about that, and no one had a satisfactory theory. The detective therefore kept discreetly silent. This did not seem to offend Miss Strange. On the contrary, it gave her an opportunity to babble away to her heart's content. One, two, three, four, five, six, she counted with a shudder at every count, and one of them bigger than the others. She might have added, it is the trail of one foot and strangely intermingled at that. But she did not, though we may be quite sure that she noted the fact. And where, just where, did the old wallet fall? Here or here? She had moved as she spoke, so that in uttering the last here, she stood directly before the window. The surprise she received there nearly made her forget the part she was playing. From the character of the light in the room she had expected on looking out to confront a nearby wall, but not a window in that wall. Yet that was what she saw directly facing her from across the old-fashioned alley separating this house from its neighbor. Twelve unshuttered and uncurtained panes through which she caught a darkened view of a room almost as forlorn and devoid of furniture as the one in which she then stood. When quite sure of herself, she let a certain portion of her surprise appear. Why, look, she cried, if you can't see right in next door. What a lonesome-looking place. From its desolate appearance, I should think the house quite empty. And it is. That's the old Schaefer homestead. It's been empty for a year. Oh, empty. And she turned away with the most inconsequent air in the world, crying out as her name rang up the stair. There's Arthur calling. I suppose he thinks I've been here long enough. I'm sure I'm very much obliged to you, officer. I really shouldn't have slept a wink tonight if I hadn't been given a peep at these rooms, which I had imagined so different. 
and with one additional glance over her shoulder that seemed to penetrate both windows and the desolate space beyond, she ran quickly out and down in response to her brother's reiterated call. "'Drive quickly, as quickly as the law allows, to Hiram Brown's office in Duane Street.' Arrived at the address named, she went in alone to see Mr. Brown. He was her father's lawyer and a family friend. Hardly waiting for his affectionate greeting, she cried out quickly, "'Tell me how I can learn anything about the old Schaefer house in 17th Street.' "'Now don't look so surprised. I have very good reasons for my request, and, and I'm in an awful hurry. "'But I know, I know, there's been a dreadful tragedy next door to it, but it's about the Schaefer house itself. I want some information. Has it an agent? Uh, of course it has an agent, and here is his name. Mr. Brown presented her with a card on which he had hastily written both name and address. She thanked him, dropped him a mocking curtsy full of charm, whispered, Don't tell father, and was gone. Her manner to the man she next interviewed was very different. As soon as she saw him, she subsided into her usual society manner. With just a touch of the conceit of the successful debutante, she announced herself as Miss Strange of 72nd Street. Her business with him was in regard to the possible renting of the Schaefer house. She had an old lady friend who was desirous of living downtown. In passing through 17th Street, she had noticed that the old Schaefer house was standing empty, and had been immediately struck with the advantages it possessed for her elderly friend's occupancy. Could it be that the house was for rent? There was no sign on it to that effect, but etc. His answer left her nothing to hope for. It is going to be torn down, he said. Oh, what a pity, she exclaimed. Real colonial, isn't it? I wish I could see the rooms inside before it is disturbed. Such doors and such dear old-fashioned mantelpieces as it must have. I just dote on the colonial. It brings up such pictures of the old days, weddings, you know, and parties, all so different from ours and so much more interesting. Is it the chance shot that tells? Sometimes. Violet had no especial intention in what she said, save as a prelude to a pending request. But nothing could have served her purpose better than that one word, wedding. The agent laughed, and giving her his first indulgent look, remarked genially, Romance is not confined to those ancient times. If you were to enter that house today, you would come across evidences of a wedding as romantic as any which ever took place in all the seventy-odd years of its existence. A man and a woman were married there day before yesterday, who did their first courting under its roof forty years ago. He has been married twice, and she once in the interval, but the old love held firm, and now at the age of sixty and over they have come together to finish their days in peace and happiness, or so we will hope. Married? Married in that house and on the day that... She caught herself up in time. He did not notice the break. Yes, in memory of those old days of courtship, I suppose. They came here about five, got the keys, drove off, went through the ceremony in that empty house, returned the keys to me in my own apartment, took the steamer for Naples, and were on the sea before midnight. And do you not call that quick work as well as highly romantic? Very. Miss Strange's cheek had paled. It was apt to when she was greatly excited. But I don't understand, she added the moment after. How could they do this and nobody know about it? I should have thought it would have got into the papers. They are quiet people. I don't think they told their best friends. A simple announcement in the next day's journals testified to the fact of their marriage, but that was all. I would not have felt at liberty to mention the circumstances myself if the parties were not well on their way to Europe. Oh, how glad I am that you did tell me. Such a story of constancy and the hold which old associations have upon sensitive minds. 
But why, miss, what's the matter? You look very much disturbed. Don't you remember? Haven't you thought? Something else happened that very day and almost at the same time on that block. Something very dreadful. Mrs. Doolittle's murder. Yes, it was as near as next door, wasn't it? Oh, if this happy couple had known. But fortunately they didn't, nor are they likely to till they reach the other side. You needn't fear that their honeymoon will be spoiled that way. But they may have heard something or seen something before leaving the street. Did you notice how the gentleman looked when he returned you the keys? I did, and there was no cloud on his satisfaction. Oh, how you relieve me. One, two dimples made their appearance in Miss Strange's fresh young cheeks. Well, I wish them joy. Do you mind telling me their names? I cannot think of them as actual persons without knowing their names. The gentleman was Constantine Amidon, the lady Marion Schaefer. You will have to think of them now as Mr. and Mrs. Amidon. And I will. Thank you, Mr. Hutton. Thank you very much. Next to the pleasure of getting the house for my friend is that of hearing this charming bit of news in its connection. She held out her hand and, as he took it, remarked, They must have had a clergyman and witnesses. Undoubtedly. I wish I had been one of the witnesses, she sighed sentimentally. They were two old men. Oh, no, don't tell me that. Fogies, nothing less. But the clergyman, he must have been young. Surely there was someone there capable of appreciating the situation. I can't say about that. I did not see the clergyman. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Miss Strange's manner was as nonchalant as it was charming. We will think of him as being very young. And with a merry toss of her head, she flitted away. But she sobered very rapidly upon entering her limousine. Hello? Ah, is that you? Yes, I want a Marconi sent. A Marconi? Yes, to the Critic, which left Doc the very night in which we are so deeply interested. Good. Whom to? The Captain? No, to a Mrs. Constantine Amidon. But first be sure there is such a passenger. Mrs.? What idea have you there? Excuse my not stating over the telephone. The message is to be to this effect. Did she, at any time immediately before or after her marriage to Mr. Amidon, get a glimpse of anyone in the adjoining house? No remarks, please. I use the telephone because I am not ready to explain myself. If she did, let her send a written description to you of that person as soon as she reaches the Azores. You surprise me. May I not call or hope for a line from you early tomorrow? I shall be busy till you get your answer. He hung up the receiver. He recognized the resolute tone. But the time came when the pending explanation was fully given to him. An answer had been returned from the steamer, favorable to Violet's hopes. Mrs. Amidon had seen such a person, and would send a full description of the same at the first opportunity. It was news to fill Violet's heart with pride. The filament of a clue which had led to this great result had been so nearly invisible, and had felt so like nothing in her grasp. To her employer she described it as follows. When I hear or read of a case which contains any baffling features, I am apt to feel some hidden chord in my nature thrilled to one fact in it and not to any of the others. In this case, the single fact which appealed to my imagination was the dropping of the stolen wallet in that upstairs room. Why did the guilty man drop it? And why, having dropped it, did he not pick it up again? But one answer seemed possible. He had heard or seen something at the spot where it fell, which not only alarmed him, but sent him in flight from the house. Very good. And did you settle to your own mind the nature of that sound or that sight? I did. Her manner was strangely businesslike. No show of dimples now. 
satisfied that if any possibility remained of my ever doing this it would have to be on the exact place of this occurrence or not at all i embraced your suggestion and visited the house and that room no doubt and that room women somehow seem to manage such things so i've noticed miss strange and what was the result of your visit what did you discover there this that one of the blood spots marking the criminal's steps through the room was decidedly more pronounced than the rest and what was even more important that the window out of which i was looking had its counterpart in the house on the opposite side of the alley in gazing through the one i was gazing through the other and not only that but into the darkened area of the room beyond instantly i saw how the latter fact might be made to explain the former one but before i say how let me ask if it is quite settled among you that the smears on the floor and stairs mark the passage of the criminal's footsteps certainly and very bloody feet they must have been too his shoes or rather his one shoe for the proof is plain that only the right one left its mark must have become thoroughly saturated to carry its traces so far do you think that any amount of saturation would have done this or if you are not ready to agree to that that a shoe so covered with blood could have failed to leave behind it some hint of its shape some imprint however faint of heel or toe but nowhere did it do this we see a smear and that is all you are right miss strange you are always right and what do you gather from this she looked to see how much he expected from her and meeting an eye not quite as free from ironic suggestion as his words had led her to expect faltered a little as she proceeded to say my opinion is a girl's opinion but such as it is you have the right to have it from the indications mentioned i could draw but this conclusion that the blood which accompanied the criminal's footsteps was not carried through the house by his shoes he wore no shoes he did not even wear stockings probably he had none for reasons which appealed to his judgment he went about his wicked work barefoot and it was the blood from his own veins and not from those of his victim which made the trail we have followed with so much interest do you forget those broken beads how he kicked them about and stamped upon them in his fury one of them pierced the ball of his foot and that so sharply that it not only spurted blood but kept on bleeding with every step he took otherwise the trail would have been lost after his passage up the stairs fine there was no irony in the bureau chief's eye now you are progressing miss strange allow me i pray to kiss your hand it is a liberty i have never taken but one which would greatly relieve my present stress of feeling she lifted her hand toward him but it was in gesture not in recognition of his homage thank you said she but i claim no monopoly on deductions so simple as these i have not the least doubt that not only yourself but every member of the force has made the same but there is a little matter which may have escaped the police may even have escaped you to that i would now call your attention since through it i have been enabled after a little necessary groping to reach the open you remember the one large blotch on the upper floor where the man dropped the wallet that blotch more or less commingled with a fainter one possessed great significance for me from the first moment i saw it how came his foot to bleed so much more profusely at that one spot than at any other there could be but one answer because here a surprise met him a surprise so startling to him in his present state of mind that he gave a quick spring backward with the result that his wounded foot came down suddenly and forcibly instead of easily as in his previous weary tread and what was the surprise i made it my business to find out and now i can tell you that it was the sight of a woman's face staring upon him from the neighboring house which he had probably been told was empty the shock disturbed his judgment he saw his crime discovered his guilty secret read and fled in unreasoning panic 
he might better have held on to his wits. It was this display of fear which led me to search after its cause, and consequently to discover that at this especial hour more than one person had been in the Schaefer house, that, in fact, a marriage had been celebrated there under circumstances as romantic as any we read of in books, and that this marriage, privately carried out, had been followed by an immediate voyage of the happy couple on one of the White Star steamers. With the rest you are conversant. I do not need to say anything about what has followed the sending of that Marconi. But I am going to say something about your work in this matter, Miss Strange. The big detectives about here will have to look sharp if... Don't, please, not yet. A smile softened the asperity of this interruption. The man has yet to be caught and identified. Till that is done, I cannot enjoy anyone's congratulations. And you will see that all this may not be so easy. If no one happened to meet the desperate wretch before he had an opportunity to retie his shoelaces, there will be little for you or even for the police to go upon, but his wounded foot, his undoubtedly carefully prepared alibi, and later a woman's confused description of a face seen but for a moment only, and that under a personal excitement precluding minute attention. I should not be surprised if the whole thing came to nothing." but it did not. As soon as the description was received from Mrs. Amidon, a description, by the way, which was unusually clear and precise, owing to the peculiar and contradictory features of the man, the police were able to recognize him among the many suspects always under their eye. Arrested, he pleaded, just as Miss Strange had foretold, an alibi of a seemingly unimpeachable character, but neither it nor the plausible explanation with which he endeavored to account for a freshly healed scar amid the calluses of his right foot could stand before Mrs. Amidon's unequivocal testimony that he was the same man she had seen in Mrs. Doolittle's upper room on the afternoon of her own happiness and of that poor woman's murder. The moment when, at his trial, the two faces again confronted each other across a space no wider than that which had separated them on the dread occasion in 17th Street is said to have been one of the most dramatic in the annals of that ancient courtroom. End of Problem 3 An Intangible Clue Recording by Gothica Faircourt Section 4 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green Section 4 Problem 4 The Grotto Spectre Part 1 Miss Strange was not often pensive, at least not at large functions or when under the public eye, but she certainly forgot herself at Mrs. Provost's musicale, and that, too, without apparent reason. Had the music been of high order, one might have understood her abstraction, but it was of decidedly mediocre quality, and Violet's ear was much too fine and her musical sense too cultivated for her to be beguiled by anything less than the very best. Nor had she the excuse of a dull companion. Her escort for the evening was a man of unusual conversational powers. But she seemed to be almost oblivious of his presence. And when, through some passing courteous impulse, she did turn her ear his way, it was with just that tinge of preoccupation which betrays the divided mind. Were her thoughts with some secret problem yet unsolved? It would scarcely seem so from the gay remark with which she had left home. She was speaking to her brother, and her words were, I'm going out to enjoy myself. I've not a care in the world. The slate is quite clean. Yet she had never seemed more out of tune with her surroundings, nor shown a mood further removed from trivial entertainment. What had happened to becloud her gaiety in the short time which, which had since elapsed? We can answer in a sentence. She had seen among a group of young men in a distant doorway, 
one with a face so individual and of an expression so extraordinary that all interest in the people about her had stopped as a clock stops when the pendulum is held back she could see nothing else think of nothing else not that it was so very handsome though no other had ever approached it in its power over her imagination but because of its expression of haunting melancholy a melancholy so settled and so evidently the result of long continued sorrow that her interest had been reached and her heartstrings shaken as never before in her whole life she would never be the same violet again yet moved as she undoubtedly was she was not conscious of the least desire to know who the young man was or even to be made acquainted with his story she simply wanted to dream her dream undisturbed it was therefore with a sense of unwelcome shock that in the course of the reception following the program she perceived this fine young man approaching herself with his right hand touching his left shoulder and the peculiar way which committed her to an interview with or without a formal introduction should she fly the ordeal be blind and deaf to whatever was significant in his action and go her way before he reached her thus keeping her dream intact impossible his eyes prevented that his glance had caught hers and she felt forced to await his advance and give him her first spare moment it came soon and when it came she greeted him with a smile it was the first she had ever bestowed in welcome of a confidence of whose tenor she was entirely ignorant but to her relief he showed his appreciation of the dazzling gift though he made no effort to return it scorning all preliminaries in his eagerness to discharge himself of a burden which was fast becoming intolerable he addressed her at once in these words you are very good miss strange to receive me in this unconventional fashion i am in that desperate state of mind which precludes etiquette will you listen to my petition i am told you know by whom and again he touched his shoulder that you have resources of intelligence which especially fit you to meet the extraordinary difficulties of my position may i beg you to exercise them on my behalf no man would be more grateful if but i see you do not recognize me i am roger upjohn that i am admitted to this gathering is owing to the fact that our hostess knew and loved my mother in my anxiety to meet you and proffer my plea i was willing to brave the cold looks you have probably noticed are the faces of the people about us but i have no right to subject you to criticism i remain violet's voice was troubled her self-possession disturbed but there was a command in her tone which he was only too glad to obey i know the name who did not and possibly my duty to myself should make me shun a confidence which may burden me without relieving you but you have been sent to me by one whose behests i feel bound to respect and mistrusting her voice she stopped the suffering which made itself apparent in the face before her appealed to her heart in a way to rob her of judgment she did not wish this to be seen and so fell silent he was quick to take advantage of her obvious embarrassment should i have been sent to you if i had first not secured the confidence of the sender you know the scandal attached to my name some of it just some of it very unjust if you will grant me an interview to-morrow i will make an endeavour to refute certain charges which i have hitherto let go unchallenged will you do me this favour will you listen in your own house to what i have to say instinct cried out against any such concession on her part bidding her beware of one who charmed without excellence and convinced without reason but compassion urged compliance and compassion won the day though conscious of weakness she violet strange on whom strong men had come to rely in critical hours calling for well-balanced judgment she did not let this concern her or allow herself to indulge in useless regrets even after the first effect of his presence had passed and she had succeeded in recalling the facts which had cast a cloud about his name roger upjohn was a widower and the scandal affecting him was connected with his wife's death though a degenerate in some respects lacking the domineering presence the strong mental qualities and inflexible character of his progenitors the wealthy massachusetts upjohns whose great place on the coast had a history as old as the state itself he yet had gifts and attractions of his own which would have made him a worthy representative of his race if only he had not fixed his affections on a woman so cold and heedless 
that she would have inspired universal aversion instead of love. Had she not been dowered with the beauty and physical fascination which sometimes accompany a hard heart and a scheming brain. It was this beauty which had caught the lad, and one day, just as careful father had mapped out a course of study calculated to make a man of his son, that son drove up to the gates with this lady, whom he introduced as his wife. The shock, not of her beauty, though that was of dazzling quality, which catches a man in the throat and makes a slave of him while the first surprise lasts, but of the overthrow of all of his hopes and plans, nearly prostrated Homer Upjohn. He saw, as most men did the moment judgment returned, that for all her satin skin and rosy flush, the wonder of her hair and the smile which pierced like arrows and warmed like wine, she was more likely to bring a curse into the house than a blessing. And so it proved. In less than a year the young husband had lost all his ambitions and many of his best impulses. No longer inclined to study, he spent his days in satisfying his wife's whims, and his evenings in carousing with the friends with which she had provided him. This in Boston, whither they had fled from the old gentleman's displeasure. But after their little son came, the father insisted upon their returning home, which led to great deceptions and precipitated a tragedy no one ever understood. They were natural gamblers, this couple, as all Boston society knew, and as Homer Upjohn loathed cards, they found life slow in the great house, and grew correspondingly restless till they made a discovery, or shall I say rediscovery, of the once famous grotto hidden in the rocks lining their portion of the coast. Here they found a retreat where they could hide themselves, often when they were thought to be abed and asleep, and play together for money, or for a supper in the city, or for anything else that foolish fancy suggested. This was while their little son remained an infant. Later, they were less easily satisfied. Both craved company, excitement, and gambling on a large scale. So they took to inviting friends to meet them in this grotto, which, through the agency of one old servant devoted to Roger to the point of folly, had been fitted up and lighted in a manner not only comfortable, but luxurious. A small but sheltered haven hidden in the curve of the rocks made an approach by boat feasible at high tide, and at low the connection could be made by means of a path over the promontory in which this grotto was concealed. The fortune which Roger had inherited from his mother made these excesses possible, but many thousands, let alone the few he could call his, soon disappeared under the witchery of an irresponsible woman, and the half-dozen friends who knew his secret had to stand by and see his ruin, without daring to utter a word to the one who alone could stay it for Homer Upjohn was not a man to be approached lightly, nor he was one to listen to charges without ocular proof to support them, and this called for courage, more courage than was possessed by any one who knew them both. He was a hard man, was Homer Upjohn, but with a heart of gold for those he loved. This even his wary daughter-in-law was wise enough to detect, and for a long while after the birth of her child, she besieged him with her coaxing ways and bewitching graces. But he never changed his first opinion of her, and once she became fully convinced of the folly of her efforts, she gave up all attempts to please him, and showed an open indifference. This in time gradually extended, till it embraced not only her child, but her husband as well. Yes, it had come to that. His love no longer contented her. Her vanity had grown by which it daily fed on, and now called for the admiration of the fast man, who sometimes came up from Boston to play with them in their unholy retreat. To win this, she dressed like some demon queen, or witch, though it drove her husband into deeper play, and threatened an exposure which would mean disaster not only to herself, but to the whole family. In all this, as anyone could see, Roger had been her slave and the willing victim of all her caprices. What was it, then, which so completely changed him that a separation began to be talked of, and even its terms discussed. One rumor had it that the father had discovered the secret of the grotto, and exacted this as penalty from the son who had dishonored him. Another, that Roger himself was the one to take the initiative in this matter, that on returning unexpectedly from New York one evening, and finding her missing from the house, he had traced her to the grotto, 
where he came upon her playing a desperate game with the man he had the greatest reason to distrust. But whatever the explanation of this sudden change in their relations, there is but little doubt that a legal separation between this ill-assorted couple was pending. When one bleak autumn morning she was discovered dead in her bed under the circumstances peculiarly open to comment. The physicians who made out the certificate ascribed her death to heart disease, symptoms of which had lately much alarmed the family doctor, but that a personal struggle of some kind had preceded the fatal attack was evident from the bruises which blackened her wrists. Had there been the like upon her throat, it might have gone hard with the young husband, who was known to be contemplating her dismissal from the house. But the discoloration of her wrist was all, and as bruised wrists do not kill, and there was besides no evidence forthcoming of the two having spent one moment together for at least ten hours preceding the tragedy, but rather full and satisfactory testimony to the contrary, the matter lapsed, and all criminal proceedings were avoided. But not the scandal, which always follows the unexplained. As time passed, and the peculiar look which betrays the haunted soul gradually became visible in the young widower's eyes, doubts arose, and reports circulated which cast strange reflections upon the tragic end of his mistaken marriage. Stories of the disreputable use to which the old grotto had been put were mingled with vague hints of conjugal violence, never properly investigated. The result was his general avoidance, not only by the social set dominated by his high-minded father, but of his own less reputable coterie, which, however lax in its moral code, had very little use for a coward. Such was the gossip which had reached Violet's ears in connection with this new client prejudicing her altogether against him till she caught that beam of deep and concentrated suffering in his eye, and recognized an innocence which ensured her sympathy and led her to grant him the interview for which he so earnestly entreated. He came to her prompt to the hour, and when she saw him again with the marks of a sleepless night upon him and all the signs of suffering intensified in his unusual countenance, she felt her heart sink within her in a way she failed to understand. A dread of what she was about to hear robbed her of all semblance of self-possession, and she stood like one in a dream as he uttered his first greetings, and then paused to gather up his own moral strength before he began his story. When he did speak, it was to say, I find myself obliged to break a vow I've made to myself. You cannot understand my need unless I show you my heart. My trouble is not with the one with which men have credited me. It has another source, and is infinitely harder to bear. Personal dishonor I have deserved in a greater or lesser degree, but the trial which has come to me now involves a person more dear to me than myself, and this is totally without alleviation, unless you... He paused, choked, and then recommenced abruptly. My wife, Violet held her breath, was supposed to have died from heart disease, or or some strange species of suicide. There were reasons for this conclusion, reasons which I accepted without serious question till some five weeks ago when I made a discovery which led me to fear. The broken sentence hung suspended. Violet, notwithstanding his hurried gesture, could not restrain herself from stealing a look at his face. It was set in horror and, though partially turned aside, made an appeal to her compassion to fill the void made by his silence, without further suggestion from him. She did this by saying tentatively, and with as little show of emotion as possible, You feared that the event called for vengeance, and that vengeance would mean increased suffering to yourself as well as to another. Yes, great suffering. But I may be under a most lamentable mistake. I am not sure of my conclusions. If my doubts have no real foundation, if they are simply the offspring of my own diseased imagination, what an insult to one I revere! What a horror of ingratitude and misunderstanding! Relate the facts, came in startled tones from Violet. They may enlighten us. He gave one quick shudder, buried his face for a moment in his hands, then lifted it and spoke up quickly and with unexpected firmness. I came here to do so, and do so I will. But where begin? Miss Strange, you cannot be ignorant of the circumstances, open and avowed, which attended my wife's death. But there were other and secret events in its connection which happily have been kept from the world. 
but which I must now disclose to you at any cost to my pride and so-called honor. This is the first one. On the morning preceding the day of Mrs. Upjohn's death, an interview took place between us at which my father was present. You do not know my father, Miss Strange. A strong man and a stern one, with a hold upon old traditions which nothing can shake. If he has a weakness, it is for my little boy Roger, in whose promising traits he sees the one hope which has survived the shipwreck of all for which our name has stood. Knowing this, and realizing what the child's presence in the house meant to his old age, I felt my heart turn sick with apprehension. When in the midst of the discussion as to the terms of which my wife would consent to a permanent separation, the little fellow came dancing into the room, his curls a-toss and his whole face beaming with life and joy. She had not mentioned the child, but I knew her well enough to be sure that at the first show of preference on his part for either his grandfather or myself, she would raise a claim to him which she would never relinquish. I dared not speak, but I met his eager looks with my most foreboding frown and hoped by this show of severity to hold him back. But his little heart was full, and ignoring her outstretched arms, he bounded towards mine with his most affectionate cry. She saw and uttered her ultimatum. The child should go with her, or she would not consent to a separation. It was useless for us to talk. She had said her last word. The blow struck me hard, or so I thought, till I looked at my father. Never had I beheld such a change as that one moment had made in him. He stood as before. He faced us with the same silent reprobation, but his heart had run from him like water. It was a sight to call up all my resources, to allow her to remain now, with my feeling towards her all changed, and my father's eyes fully opened to her stony nature, was impossible. Nor could I appeal to law. An open scandal was my father's greatest dread, and divorce proceedings his horror. The child would have to go unless I could find a way to influence her through her own nature. I knew of but one. Do not look at me, Miss Strange. It was dishonoring to us both, and I am horrified now when I think of it. But to me, at that time, it was natural enough as a last resort. There was but one debt which my wife ever paid, but one promise she ever kept. It was that made at the gaming table. I offered as soon as my father, realizing the hopelessness of the situation, had gone tottering from the room, to gamble with her for the child. And she accepted. The shame and humiliation expressed in this final whisper, the sudden darkness, for a storm was coming up, shook Violet to the soul. With strained gaze fixed on the man before her, now little more than a shadow in the prevailing gloom, she waited for him to resume, and waited in vain. The minutes passed, the darkness became intolerable, and instinctively her hand crept towards the electric button beneath which she was sitting, but she failed to press it. A tale so dark called for an atmosphere of its own kind. She would cast no light upon it. Yet she shivered as the silence continued, and started in uncontrollable dismay when at length her strange visitor rose, and still without speaking, walked away from her to the other end of the room, only so we could go on with the shameful tale, and presently she heard his voice once more in these words. Our house is large, and its rooms many. But for such work as we two contemplated, there was but one spot where we could command absolute seclusion. You may have heard of it. A famous natural grotto hidden in our own portion of the coast, and so fitted up as to form a retreat for our miserable selves when escape from my father's eyes seemed desirable. It was not easy of access, and no one, so far as we knew, had ever followed us there. But to ensure ourselves against any possible interruption, we waited till the whole house was abed before we left it for the grotto. We went by boat and— Oh, the dip of those oars! I hear them yet. And the witchery of her face in the moonlight, and the mockery of her low, fitful laugh. As I caught the sinister note in its silvery rise and fall, I knew what was before me if I failed to retain my composure. And I strove to hold it, and meet her calmness with stoicism, and the taunt of her expression with a mask of immobility. But the effort was hopeless, and when the time came for dealing out the cards, my eyes were burning in their sockets, and my hands shivering like leaves in a rising gale. 
We played one game, and my wife lost. We played another, and my wife won. We played the third, and the fate I had foreseen from the first became mine. The luck was with her, and I had lost my boy. A gasp, a pause during which the thunder spoke and the lightning flashed. Then a hurried catching of his breath and the tale went on. A burst of laughter rising gaily above the boom of the sea announced her victory. Her laugh and the taunting words, You play badly, Roger. The child is mine. Never fear that I shall fail to teach him to revere his father. Had I a word to throw back? No. When I realized anything but my dishonored manhood, I found myself in the grotto's mouth, staring helplessly out upon the sea. The boat which had floated us in at high tide lay stranded but a few feet away. But I did not reach for it. Escape was quicker over the rocks, and I made for the rocks. That it was a cowardly act to leave her there to find her way back alone at midnight, but the same rough road I was taking did not strike my mind for an instant. I was in flight from my own past, in flight from myself and the haunting dread of madness. When I awoke to reality again, it was to find the small door by which we had left the house standing slightly ajar. I was troubled by this, for I was sure of having closed it, but the impression was brief, and entering, I went stumbling up to my room, leaving the way open behind me more from sheer inability to exercise my will than from any thought of her. Miss Strange. He had come out of the shadows and was standing now directly before her. I must ask you to trust implicitly in what I tell you of my further experiences that fatal night. It was not necessary for me to pass my little son's door in order to reach the room I was making for, but anguish took me there and held me glued to the panels for what seemed a long, long time. When I finally crept away, it was to go to the room I had chosen in the top of the house, where I had my hour of hell and faced my desolated future. Did I hear anything meantime in the halls below? No. Did I even listen for the sound of her return? No. I was callous to everything, dead to everything but my own misery. I did not even heed the approach of morning, till suddenly, with a shrillness no ear could ignore, there rose, tearing through the silence of the house, the great scream from my wife's room, which announced the discovery of her body lying stark and cold in her bed. They said I showed a little feeling. He moved off again and spoke from somewhere in the shadows. Do you wonder at this after such a manifest stroke by a benevolent providence? My wife being dead, Roger was saved to us. It was the one song of my still undisciplined soul, and I had to assume coldness, lest they should see the greatness of my joy. A wicked and guilty rejoicing, you will say, and you are right. But I had no memory then of the part I had played in this fatality. I had forgotten my reckless flight from the grotto, which left her no aid but that of her own triumphant spirit to help her over those treacherous rocks. The necessity for keeping secret this part of our disgraceful story led me to exert myself to keep it out of my own mind. It has only come back to me in all of its force since a new horror, a new suspicion, has driven me to review carefully every incident of that awful night. I was never a man of much logic, and when they came to me on that morning of which I have just spoken, and took me to where she lay and pointed to her beautiful, cold body stretched out in seeming peace, under the satin coverlet, and then to the pile of dainty clothes lying neatly folded on a chair, which is one fair slipper on top, I shuddered at her fate, but asked no questions, not even when one of the women of the house mentioned the circumstances of the single slipper, and said that a search should be made for its maid. Nor was I as much impressed as one would naturally expect, by the whisper dropped in my ear that something was the matter with her wrists. It is true that I lifted the lace they had carefully spread over them, and examined the discoloration which extended like a ring about each pearly arm. But having no memories of any violence offered her, I had not so much as laid a hand upon her in the grotto. These marks failed to rouse my interest. But, and now I must leap a year in my story, there came a time when both of these facts recurred to my mind with startling distinctness and clamored for explanation. End of Problem 4 the Grotto Spectre, Part 1
Section 5 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 5. Problem 4. The Grotto Spectre, Part 2. I had risen above the shock which such a death following such a bench would naturally occasion even in one of my blunted sensibilities, and was striving to live a new life under the encouragement of my now fully reconciled father. When accident forced me to re-enter the grotto where I had never stepped foot since that night, a favorite dog in chase of some innocent prey had escaped the leash and run into its dim recesses and would not come out at my call. As I needed him immediately for the hunt, I followed him over the promontory, and, swallowing my repugnance, slid into the grotto to get him. Better a plunge to my death from the height of the rocks towering above it. For there, in a remote corner, lighted up by a reflection from the sea, I beheld my setter crouched above an object which in another moment I recognized as my dead wife's missing slipper. Here! Not in the waters of the sea or in the interstices of the rocks outside, but here! Proof that she had never walked back to the house where she was found lying quietly in her bed. Proof positive, for I knew the path too well, and the more than usual tenderness of her feet. How then did she get there, and by whose agency? Was she living when she went, or was she already dead? A year had passed since that delicate shoe had borne her from the boat into these dim recesses but it might have been only a day so vividly did i live over this moment of awful enlightenment all the events of the hour in which we sat there playing for the possession of our child again i saw her gleaming eyes her rosy working mouth her slim white hand loaded with diamonds clutching the cards again i heard the lap of the sea on the pebbles outside and smelt the odor of the wine she had poured out for us both the bottle which had held it the glass from which she had drunk lay now in pieces on the rocky floor. The whole scene was mine again, and as I followed the events to its despairing close, I seemed to see my own wild figure springing away from her to the grotto's mouth and so over the rocks. But here fancy faltered, caught by a quick recollection to which I had never given a thought till now. As I made my way along those rocks, a sound had struck my ear from where some stunted bushes made a shadow in the moonlight. The wind might have caused it, or some small night creature hustling away at my approach, and to some such cause I must at the time have attributed it. But now, with brain fired by suspicion, it seemed more like the quick intake of a human breath. Someone had been lying there in wait, listening at the one loophole in the rocks, where it was possible to hear what was said and done in the heart of the grotto. But who? Who? And for what purpose this listening? And to what end did it lead? Though I no longer loved even the memory of my wife, I felt my hair lift as I asked myself these questions. There seemed to be but one logical answer to the last, and it was this. A struggle followed by death. The shoe fallen from her foot, the clothes folded in her room, my wife was never orderly, and the dimly blackened wrists, which were snow-white when she dealt the cards, all seemed to point to such a conclusion. She may have died from heart failure, but a struggle had preceded her death, during which some man's strong fingers had been locked about her wrists, and again the question rose, whose? If any place was ever hated by mortal man, that grotto was hated by me. I loathed its walls, its floors, its every visible and invisible corner. To linger there, to look, almost tore my soul from my body. Yet I did linger, and did look, and this is what I found by way of reward. Behind a projecting ledge of stone from which a tattered rug still hung, I came upon two nails driven a few feet apart into a fissure of the rock. I had driven those nails myself long before for a certain gymnastic attachment much in vogue at the time, and on looking closer, I discovered hanging from them the rope ends by which I was wont to pull myself about. So far there was nothing to rouse any but innocent reminiscences, but when I heard the dog's low moan and saw him leap at the curled-up ends and nose them with an eager look my way, 
I remembered the dark marks circling the wrists about which I had so often clasped my mother's bracelets, and the world went black before me. When consciousness returned, when I could once more move and see and think, I noted another fact. Cards were strewn about the floor, face up and in a fixed order as if laid in a mocking mood to be looked upon by reluctant eyes. And near the ominous half-circle they made, a cushion from the lounge, stained horribly with what I then thought to be blood, but which I afterwards found to be wine. Vengeance spoke in these ropes and in the carefully spread out cards, and murder in the smothering pillow. The vengeance of one who had watched her corroding influence eat the life out of my honor, and whose love for our little Roger was such that any deed which ensured his continued presence in the home appeared not only warrantable, but obligatory. Alas, I knew of but one person in this whole world who could cherish feeling to this extent, or possess sufficient power to carry her lifeless body back to the house and lay it in her bed and give no sign of the abominable act from that day on to this. Miss Strange, there are men who have a peculiar conception of duty. My father... You need not go on. How gently, how tenderly our Violet spoke. I understand your trouble. Did she? She paused to ask herself if this were so. And he, deaf perhaps to her words, caught up his broken sentence and went on. My father was in the hall the day I came staggering in from my visit to the grotto. No words passed, but our eyes met, and from that hour I have seen death in his countenance, and he has seen it in mine. Like two opponents, each struck to the heart, who stand facing each other with simulated smiles till they fall. My father will drop first. He is old, very old since that day five weeks ago, and to see him die and not be sure, to see the grave close over a possible innocence, and I, left here in ignorance of the blissful fact till my own eyes close forever, is more than I can hold up under, more than any son could. Cannot you help me, then, to a positive knowledge? Think! Think! A woman's mind is strangely penetrating, and yours, I am told, has an intuitive faculty more to be relied upon than the reasoning of men. It must suggest some means of confirming my doubts, or of definitely ending them. Then Violet stirred, and looked about at him, and finally found voice. Tell me something of your father's ways. What are his habits? Does he sleep well, or is he wakeful at night? He has poor nights. I do not know how poor, because I am not often with him. His valet, who has always been in our family, shares his room and acts as his constant nurse. He can watch over him better than I can. He has no distracting trouble on his mind. And little Roger? Does your father see much of little Roger? Does he fondle him and seem happy in his presence? Yes, yes. I have often wondered at it, but he does. They are great chums. It is a pleasure to see them together. And the child clings to him, shows no fear, sits on his lap or on the bed, and plays as children do play with his beard or with his watch chain. Yes, only once have I seen my little chap shrink and that was when my father gave him a look of unusual intensity, looking for his mother in him, perhaps. Mr. Upjohn, forgive me the question. It seems necessary. Does your father, or rather did your father before he fell ill, ever walk in the direction of the grotto, or haunt in any way the rocks which surround it? I cannot say. The sea is there. He naturally loves the sea. But I have never seen him standing on the promontory. Which way do his windows look? Towards the sea. Therefore, towards the promontory? Yes. Can he see it from his bed? No. Perhaps that is the cause of the peculiar habit he has. What habit? Every night before he retires, he is not yet confined to his bed, he stands for a few minutes in his front window looking out. He says that it is good night to the ocean. When he no longer does this, we shall know that his end is very near. The face of Violet began to clear. Rising, she turned on the electric light, and then, reseating herself, were marked with an aspect of quiet cheer. I have two ideas. 
but they necessitate my presence at your place. You will not mind a visit? My brother will accompany me. Roger Upjohn did not need to speak, hardly to make a gesture. His expression was so eloquent. She thanked him as if he had answered in words, adding with an air of gentle reserve, Providence assist us in this matter. I am invited to Beverly next weekend to attend a wedding. I was intending to stay two days, but I will make it three, and spend the extra one with you. What are your requirements, Miss Strange? I presume you have some. Violet turned from the imposing portrait of Mr. Upjohn, which she had been gravely contemplating, and met the troubled eye of her young host with an enigmatical flash of her own, but she made no answer in words. Instead, she lifted her right hand and ran one slender finger thoughtfully up the casing of the door near which they stood, till it struck a nick in the old mahogany, almost on level with her head. "'Is your son Roger old enough to reach so far?' she asked with another short look at him as she let her finger rest where it had struck the roughened wood i thought he was a little fellow he is that cut was made by by my wife a sample of her capricious wilfulness she wished to leave a record of herself in the substance of our house as well as in our lives that nick marks her height she laughed when she made it till the walls cave in or burn is what she said and I thought her laugh and smile captivating. Cutting short his own laugh, which was much too sardonic for a lady's ears, he made a move as if to lead the way into another portion of the room. But Violet failed to notice this, and lingering in quiet contemplation of this suggestive little Nick, the only blemish in a room of ancient colonial magnificence, she thoughtfully remarked. Then she was a small woman, adding with seeming irrelevance, like myself. Roger winced. Something in the suggestion hurt him, and in the nod he gave there was an air of coldness, which under ordinary circumstances would have deterred her from pursuing the subject further. But the circumstances were not ordinary, and she allowed herself to say, Was she so very different from me? In figure, I mean. No. Why do you ask? Shall we not join your brother on the terrace? Not till I have answered the question you put me a moment ago. You wish to know my requirements. One of the most important you have already fulfilled. You have given your servants a half-holiday, and so doing, ensured to us full liberty of action. What else I need in the attempt I propose to make, you will find listed in this memorandum. And taking a slip of paper from her bag, she offered it to him with a hand, the trembling of which he would have noticed if he had been freer of mind. As he read, she watched him, her fingers nervously clutching her throat. "'Can you supply what I ask?' she faltered, as he failed to raise his eyes or make any move or even to utter the groan she saw surging up to his lips. "'Will you?' she impetuously urged. As his fingers closed spasmodically on the paper, it evidenced that he understood at last the trend of her daring purpose. The answer came slowly, but it came. "'I will. But what?' Her hand rose in a pleading gesture. "'Do not ask me.' but take Arthur and myself into the garden and show us the flowers. Afterwards, I should like a glimpse of the sea. He bowed, and they joined Arthur, who had already begun to stroll the grounds. Violet was seldom at a loss for talk, even at the most critical moments. But she was strangely tongue-tied on this occasion, as was Roger himself. Save for a few observations casually thrown out by Arthur, the three passed in a disquieting silence, through pergola after pergola and around beds gorgeous with every variety of fall flowers, till they turned a sharp corner and came in full view of the sea. Ah! <sighs> fell in an admiring murmur from Violet's lips as her eyes swept the horizon. Then they settled on a mass of rock jutting out from the shore in a great curve. She leaned towards her host and softly whispered, The promontory? He nodded, and Violet ventured no further, but stood for a little while gazing at the tumbled rocks, then, with a quick look back at the house, she asked him to point out his father's window. He did so, and as she noted how openly it faced the sea, her expression relaxed, and her manner lost some of its constraint. As they turned to re-enter the house, she noticed an old man picking flowers from a vine clambering over one end of the piazza. "'Who was that?' she asked. "'Our oldest servant, and my father's old man,' was Roger's reply. "'He is picking my father's favorite flowers.' 
a few late honeysuckles. How fortunate! Speak to him, Mr. Upjohn. Ask him how your father is this evening. Accompany me, and I will. And do not be afraid to enter into conversation with him. He is the mildest of creatures and devoted to his patient. He likes nothing better than to talk about him. Violet, with a meaningful look at her brother, ran up the steps at Roger's side, and as she did so, the old man turned, and Violet was astonished at the wistfulness with which he viewed her. What a dear old creature, she murmured. See how he stares this way. You would think he knew me. He is glad to see a woman about the place. He has felt our isolation. Good evening, Abram. Let this young lady have a spray of your sweetest honeysuckle. And, Abram, before you go, how is father tonight? Still sitting up? Yes, sir. He is very regular in his ways. Nine is his hour. Not a minute before, and not a minute later. I don't have to look at the clock when he says, There, Abram, I've sat up long enough. When my father retires before his time, or goes to bed without a final look at the sea, he will be a very sick man, Abram. That he will, Mr. Roger. That he will. But he's very feeble tonight. Very feeble. I noticed that he gave the boy fewer kisses than usual. Perhaps he was put out because the child was brought in half hour earlier than the stated time. He don't like changes. You know that, Mr. Roger. He don't like changes. I hardly dared to tell him that the servants were all going out in a bunch tonight. I'm sorry, muttered Roger, but he'll forget it by tomorrow. I couldn't bear to keep a single one from the concert. They'll be back in good season, and meantime we have you. Abram is worth half a dozen of them, Miss Strange. We shall miss nothing. Thank you, Mr. Roger. Thank you, faltered the old man. I tried to do my duty, and it was with another wistful glance at Violet, who looked very sweet and youthful in the half-light, he pottered away. The silence which followed his departure was as painful to her as to Roger Upjohn. When she broke it, it was with this decisive remark. That man must not speak of me to your father. He must not even mention that you have a guest tonight. Run after him and tell him so. It is necessary that your father's mind should not be taken up with present happenings. Run. Roger made haste to obey her. When he came back, she was on the point of joining her brother, but stopped to utter a final injunction. I shall leave the library, or wherever we may be sitting, just as the clock strikes half-past eight. Arthur will do the same, as by that time he will feel like smoking on the terrace. Do not father either him or myself, but take your stand here on the piazza, where you can get a full view of the right-hand wing without attracting any attention to yourself. When you hear the big clock in the hall strike nine, look up quickly at your father's window. What you see may determine— Oh, Arthur, still admiring the prospect? I do not wonder. But I find it chilly. Let us go in. Roger Upjohn, sitting by himself in the library, was watching the hands of the mantel clock slowly approaching the hour of nine. Never had silence seemed more oppressive, nor his sense of loneliness greater. Yet the boom of the ocean was distinct to the ear, and human presence no farther away than the terrace where Arthur Strange could be seen smoking out his cigar in solitude. The silence and loneliness were in Roger's own soul, and in face of the expected revelation which would make or unmake his future. The desolation they wrought was measureless. To cut his suspense short, he rose at length and hurried out to the spot designated by Miss Strange as the best point from which to keep watch upon his father's window. It was at the end of the piazza, where the honeysuckle hung, and the odor of the blossoms so pleasing to his father well nigh overpowered him not only by its sweetness but by the memories it called up. Visions of that father as he looked at all the stages of their relationship passed in a bewildering maze before him. He saw him as he appeared to his childish eyes in those early days of confidence, when the loss of the mother cast them in mutual dependence upon each other. Then a sterner picture of the relentless parent who sees but one straight course to success in this world and the next. Then the teacher, and the matured adviser, and then, oh, bitter change, the man whose hopes he had crossed, whose life he had undone, and all for her who now came stealing upon the scene with her slim, white, jeweled hand forever lifted up between them. And she! Had he ever seen her more clearly? Once more the dainty figure stepped from fairyland, 
beauteous with every grace that can allure and finally destroy a man as he saw he trembled and wished that these moments of awful waiting might pass and the test be over which would lay bare his father's heart and justify his fears or dispel them for ever but the crisis if crisis it was was one of his own making and not to be hastened or evaded with one quick glance at his father's window he turned in his impatience toward the sea whose restless and continuous moaning had at length struck his ear what was in its call to-night that he should thus sway towards it as though drawn by some dread magnetic force he had been born to the dashing of its waves and knew its every mood and all the passion of its song from the frolicsome ripple to melancholy dirge but there was something odd and inexplicable in its effect upon his spirit as he faced it at this hour grim and implacable a sound rather than a sight it seemed to hold within its invisible distances the image of his future fate what this image was or why he should seek for it in this impenetrable void he did not know he felt himself held and was struggling with this influence as with an unknown enemy when there rang out from the hall within the preparatory chimes for which his ear was waiting and then the nine slow strokes which signalized the moment when he was to look for his father's presence at the window had he wished he could not have forborne that look had his eyes been closing in death or so he felt the trembling lids would have burst apart at this call and the revelations it promised and what did he see what did that window hold for him nothing that he might not have seen there any night at this hour his father's figure drawn up behind the panes in wistful contemplation of the night no visible change in his attitude nothing forced or unusual in his manner even the hand lifted to pull down the shade moves with its familiar hesitation in a moment more that shade will be down and but no the lifted hand falls back the easy attitude becomes strained fixed he is staring now not merely gazing out upon the wastes of sky and sea and roger following the direction of his glance stares almost in breathless emotion at what those distances but now so impenetrable are giving to the eye a spectre floating in the air above the promontory the spectre of a woman of his wife clad as she had been clad that fatal night outlined in supernatural light it faces them with lifted arms showing the ends of ropes dangling from either wrist a sight awful to any eye but to a man of guilty heart ah it comes the cry for which the agonized son had been listening an old man's shriek hoarse with the remorse of sleepless nights and days of unimaginable regret and foreboding it cuts the night it cuts its way into his heart he feels his senses failing him yet he must glance once more at the window and see with his last conscious look but what's this a change has taken place in the picture and he beholds not the distorted form of his father sinking back in shame and terror before this visible image of his secret sin but that of another weak old man falling to the floor behind his back abram the attentive seemingly harmless guardian of the household abram who had never spoken a word or given a look in any way suggestive of his having played any other part in the hideous drama of their lives than that of the humble and sympathetic servant the shock was too great the relief too absolute for credence he the listener at the grotto he the avenger of the family's honor he the insurer of little roger's continuance with the family at a cost the one who loved him best would rather have died himself than pay yes there was no misdoubting this old servitor's attitude of abject appeal or the meaning of homer upjohn's joyfully uplifted countenance and outspreading arms the servant begs for mercy from a man and the master is giving thanks to heaven why giving thanks has he been the prey of cantankering doubts also has the father dreaded to discover that in the son which the son has dreaded to discover in the father it might easily be and as roger recognizes this truth and the full tragedy of their mutual lives he drops to his knees amid the honeysuckles violet you are a wonder but how did you dare this from arthur as the two rode to the train in the early morning 
The answer came a bit waveringly. I do not know. I am astonished yet at my own dairy. Look at my hands. They have not ceased trembling since the moment you threw the light upon me on the rocks. The figure of old Mr. Upjohn in the window looked so aghast. Arthur, with a short glance at the little hands she held out, shrugged his shoulders imperceptibly. It struck him that the tremulousness she complained of was due more to some parting word from their young host than from prolonged awe at her own daring. But he made no remark to this effect, only observed. Abram has confessed his guilt, I hear. Yes, and he will die of it. The master will bury the man, and not the man the master. And Roger? Not the little fellow, but the father. We will not talk of him, said she, her eyes seeking the sea where the sun in its rising was battling with a troop of lowering clouds and slowly gaining the victory. End of Problem 4 the Grotto Spectre, Part 2